Cardano has taken its sweet time to build out a proof of stake blockchain that solves the trilemma and also creates the most rock solid technical foundation possible for a powerful DApp ecosystem. Simultaneously, Cardano is putting gargantuan effort into creating opportunities for its users in what's likely to be the fastest growing economic region over the next couple of decades. When you take the immense time to build out the factory correctly, you can crush your competitors at actually making cars. Now it's time for us to make cars. Ready? Let's go. We're covering the November Cardano 360, and it was an hour 27, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit fast. We're gonna cover the Plutus application backend progress, SIP30 blockchain optimizations, the progress of the Plutus partners, some perspective on Plutus from M Labs, more details from Africa, and a possible upcoming opportunity for Cardano users. It was nice to be back with Triple H, Harrison, Hemsley, Hammond, John Woods, and others. And we got a lot of updates. We got a lot of updates. I think this is a really interesting time in Cardano. We're sort of in that quiet before the storm period. Nigel Hemsley gave us an update on what the Plutus partners are up to. He said the Plutus partners are integrating the Plutus application backend with their dApps. IOHK has been working a lot with M Labs on their NFT marketplace. More on that later. Uh, D Quadrant is also close on their project. Uh, there's a lot of mention in this Cardano 360 of IOHK working with Sunday Swap on their DEX. Uh, with M Labs, they're working on SIP30. To, which is, you, you can see SIP30 at the Cardano Foundation GitHub. It's related to the API for DAP connectors, and they're using this to connect the M Labs NFT marketplace with Nami Wallet. They're also integrating Daedalus into the smart contract ecosystem by creating a similar DAP connector for Daedalus. By the way, if you're worried at all about how the PAB will interact with Cardano's DeFi system. It may be comforting to take a look at Nigel Hemsley's resume. I've never looked at this page on the IOHK team website, but I learned that Nigel Hemsley has a mathematics degree from Imperial College London with a thesis on financial derivatives, and he started his career building derivative trading systems. I can't possibly imagine a better person to be building out the PAB so that it would work well with Cardano DeFi. John Woods was next. We saw him last time, I believe in the mid-month update, and he kind of covered similar information on the blockchain, blockchain optimizations here, but he covered it in a little bit different way that I think might make it more clear to some people. So he said, Ouroboros Prowse is the current version of Ouroboros, which propagates blocks across the network in five seconds. These five seconds are a budget to spend on improvements to the blockchain. Uh, we currently use only about two seconds of the five seconds. Bigger blocks will contain more data and will obviously propagate more slowly across the network. Hence, this concept that we're sort of spending the remaining three seconds in you know, whatever we can find to be the most optimal way to use those three seconds. Um, bigger blocks are not the only change we can kind of make to improve network optimization here. Uh, we've also got higher network limits for executing more sophisticated Plutus scripts. And those are exactly the two changes they're going to make on the main net simultaneously first. They're going to increase the block size by 12.5%. And they're going to increase the memory limit for Plutus scripts per transaction by the same 12.5%. They're jumping by 12.5% because they're trying to be prudent about security. They'll be making changes like this on a slow and steady basis until they hit their maximum throughput. So I think we're going to see these kinds of small jumps bit by bit sort of going into 2022 and for a while until they hit whatever is the prudent maximum they can get to with those jumps. This will be a period of experimentation in 2022 as demand increases and more and more dApps come online. John says they're very confident that they have built a very rock solid foundation for dApps on mainnet. And if you look at John Wood's background, you would be aware that he is intimately familiar with our biggest competitor 
and he would be a person who would know whether the foundations Cardano has been built on for DApp development are rock solid or something else. Here's John on the team page at the IOG site. It says, he has led architecture and applied cryptography at consensus and also worked with the European Central Bank on crypto-based digital currencies. So second part of that, also I think pretty pertinent for Cardano's interests as a top 10 blockchain, but this first part worked at consensus, led architecture and applied cryptography. If you don't know what consensus is, consensus is Joe Lubin's company, and it's about the most ethy of all Ethereum companies, and it includes products like MetaMask. We got a quick update from Kevin Hammond. He said they're working on the Plutus interpreter and the node. They're also working on, or at least thinking about script sharing, which might involve putting scripts in the blockchain so they can be referenced there. And that'll take some time and it'll be a long-term project but it'll reduce the size of transactions and allow more scripts to be run through a single block. Nigel came back to wrap this section of Cardano 360 up by saying they've been working for the past six months with seven or eight partners, building everything from an NFT marketplace to DEXs to an Oracle. They also have 70 or 80 businesses who are interested in launching something on the Cardano network. That's in addition to the Plutus partners. He says, we'll see a few of those before Christmas, but a lot more into the new year. That sounds insane. 70 or 80 businesses who want to launch something on the Cardano network. I think 2022 is going to be this crazy year where projects just sort of pop up. We had no idea they were going and they just sort of pop up. Speaking of existing businesses, we also heard from SingularityNet about the migration of their AGIX token to Cardano via the ERC20 converter from Ethereum. It sounds like this is a work in progress and eventually this will be completed, but they're, they said they're kind of working out uh, some edge case type scenarios. In case you don't remember, we, we covered this a long time ago when the ERC-20 converter first uh, was sort of first mentioned, but the way this will work, this will be a custodial bridge. You'll lock up your ERC-20 tokens on the Ethereum side and then mint new tokens on the Cardano side to go back to ETH if you want to. I don't know why you would, but if you want to, <laughs> you would burn the Cardano tokens and then that you would be able to unlock your tokens on the Ethereum side. Ben O'Hanlon and Matthew Caps caught up with some of the projects they've been working with that they think will really help strengthen the Cardano ecosystem. These include Ardana, Ada Handle, Liquid, Charlie 3, Occam, and Maladex. We also heard from the Marlow and Plutus teams. On the Plutus side, they mentioned that they're working really well with Sunday Swap and M Labs, and it's really helping them to get really world class software. On the Marlowe side, we found out they're talking about possibly having a kind of app store for Marlowe contracts. We also heard from Ben Hart of M Labs. They're a Plutus partner. They have almost 70 developers and are primarily a Haskell and Rust shop. He says they started out working with Liquid and then very quickly with many different protocols on Cardano, including Jero Wallet, Card Starter, and they're even working with IOG, as we referenced a few minutes ago. They're also building their NFT marketplace with the PAB team, again, which we mentioned a few minutes ago. And it sounds like it'll be called Seabug. So this NFT marketplace is interesting because it'll actually include artist royalties. This is something we've talked about in crypto for a long time, and specifically in Cardano, we've talked about it. Uh, he talked about being a previous Solidity developer. I thought this was very interesting as well. He says Solidity may have actually driven him to Haskell. It's And in Solidity, it's he says it's very easy to get something up and running, but very hard to get something correct and efficient. Um, he says the massive state and all the things that cause huge fees on Ethereum and the contention issues on Cardano are actually just two sides of the same coin related to how you manage state, which makes sense to me. If you have global state, that's a lot of data that you got to move around. If you have an EUTXO system like Cardano, then you have to have different architecture to deal with concurrency and contention. He says, 
Their primary focus right now is getting their heavy duty dApps out in the ecosystem by the end of Q4 and into Q1. So there you go. This is a Haskell shop, a Plutus partner working on multiple dApps in Cardano. And he sounded pretty confident. He didn't hesitate at all when he said, we're trying to get these dApps out by the end of Q4 and into Q1. So I think over the next four months, uh, we're going to see a lot of dApps, not just from M Labs, but from all the developers working in the Cardano space. John O'Connor, our favorite Terminator killer, also popped up to recap the Africa tour. And this isn't going to be the same information you've already heard. He actually gave us some new information and I think a pretty big hint about what could be an immense project, maybe what's next for IOHK in Africa. So he says they started out in South Africa. They talked to central banks, stock exchanges, mobile browser companies, and other private companies. He says they've got two or three very exciting deals sort of on the table in South Africa with something like 100 to 140 million users. So I paid special attention to that private sort of private companies part of this because that's going to that's going to pop up in a few minutes here. He talked about the World Mobile Zanzibar project that we've discussed many times on this channel. He also talked about Burundi and we got some new details. We knew they met with the president of Burundi, but John says they also met with four or five different ministries about implementing digital identity across the whole government. In Burundi, they're going to do a census next year to prepare for national elections. And IOG is going to see if Atala can be used during the census to start a national identity program for Burundi. John mentioned Ethiopia. Of course, we have this humanitarian crisis happening in Ethiopia. He said they, they visited the Ministry of Education to talk about extending the digital identity program beyond the initial 5 million students. That initial 5 million student program is about to launch in the next month. Uh, they, he said they also talked to other people about additional digital identity opportunities. He said he said it kind of cryptically, so I think he was trying to not mention exactly who that was. And later on, he spent a lot of time talking about how IOHK's activities are always focused on helping the average person, that they're not trying to be something like Palantir, where you're very engaged in geopolitics and things like threat assessment. That's not what IOG is up to in Africa. They're just focused on helping the average person. Kind of like John was most excited about Kenya right now. He said Kenya will be the first place they launch real buy with real loans to real businesses. He mentioned the same lack of liquidity and low default rates we talked about in a previous video. We'll come back to that in just a second. He said that Egypt was just a little R&R &R and that Charles' birthday kind of coincided with that. Sounds like it was a very busy trip. He mentioned 80 meetings, which is two to three per day. And this next part is very interesting. He said they're starting to think less about government partnerships and more about creating products that can work across all the countries. They're talking about leveraging stable coins for remittances with Atala Prism for KYC and Hydra for scaling to create remittance corridors across three or four countries. And this part is especially interesting. They're talking to companies that have large distribution across the continent, 30 to 150 million customers, to get them to partner with Cardano and deliver Cardano's technology to their customers. When I think about this, I think about the one company that was sort of mentioned during the Africa tour, but which John seemed to intentionally not mention during this Cardano 360. I did not hear John mention ShopRite, which was mentioned, I think, by both he and Charles during the actual Africa tour. So ShopRite is Africa's largest supermarket retailer. They have 2,892 stores, according to Wikipedia, and 142,000 employees. This is the biggest private, private sector employer in South Africa. So think about this. If you're trying to create a, a remittance network and you're going to use stable coins and Atala Prism and Hydra, you kind of need you kind of need retail locations for that remittance network. And Shoprite is perfect. 
if you look down here, if you look, if we look at this map, I'm going to blow this map up right here. Look at all these countries that ShopRite is in. If you're trying to create a remittance network across Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the company you want to work with. These are your retail locations. If Cardano has a remittance network that's if in the future, if they're able to build out a remittance network that operates in all of these countries, it's pretty and, and it's all working on the Cardano blockchain and it's using stable coins. It's pretty easy for that stable coin to just kind of become a common, common coin, a common currency across all of these countries. This would definitely seem to satisfy a big chunk of Cardano's pan African strategy. If everybody in all of these countries is using a stable coin based on Cardano and Itala Prism, and Hydra is helping it to scale to the levels necessary to operate uh, across this many customers. This is a great step towards that stablecoin becoming pretty prevalent in these big chunks of Sub-Saharan Africa. As always, that's all just baseless speculation, but man, it looks good. Okay, maybe not totally baseless because we we definitely they definitely mentioned uh, Shoprite. And it definitely kind of fits the bill for what's being described here. But speculation nonetheless, speculation that looks real good. So <laughs> he also talked about the project with possession. And this is the thing. This is the item that presents may in the future someday present a really interesting opportunity for Cardano holders. He says the small and medium sized businesses who borrow from possession are very stable and established. He gave the example of a distributor of Coca-Cola products, obviously very mainline people are going to be drinking Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola is more than happy to provide it. If you're the distributor for Coca-Cola in any region, basically in the world that drinks Coca-Cola, which is almost everywhere, you're going to, you're going to be pretty stable. He said the default rate on those loans when they look through Possession's uh, loan data is about 2%. Some of the companies, but there's there's not, you don't have the liquidity, you don't have the available liquidity in Kenya. So some of the companies in Kenya are charging these companies 40% interest per month. I believe I heard that correctly, 40% interest per month, which is crazy when the default rate is only 2%. You don't need to charge that much at all. Maybe there's some other cost to the lenders I can't find here, but... I, in my mind, I can't equate this 40% interest per month and the 2% default rate. It doesn't make any sense. So John mentioned this scenario. He's just throwing out a number here, but he said Cardano holders, because we have we do have liquidity in Cardano. We have a lot of liquidity in Cardano um, on the scale of the um, capital needs of these types of businesses. Cardano holders could make, say, 30% over a year, which would be an insane return. In the normal uh, developed world, that would be an insane return. If you can make that kind of return with a default rate of only 2%, man, um, I, I haven't done any lending to any sub-Saharan small and medium-sized enterprises, any SMEs, but that sounds really good to me. Um, he says Cardano holders could do this, make their 30% over the course of a year, and it would still be a fraction of what these businesses are currently paying to access capital in Kenya. He says this could be a light wallet experience with something like a Possession DAP, where you just click on the DAP and then you get information like historical performance, and then you can lend directly to Kenyan small and medium sized enterprises. I think this is a really interesting potential opportunity for Cardano holders in the future, you know, where local laws allow. There's some regulatory issues, of course, as with all things um, involving anything financial. But this sounds really promising to me. I hope you are starting out a great week and I will talk to you tomorrow.